I might have one more baseball analogy in me. I don't know. That's good stuff. So we're in the Gospel of John this morning. We've been working through John's account of the life of Jesus, and we've come to this portion where Jesus is really just making himself known. We've seen a couple different conversations now as Jesus is declaring his glory and making himself known to his own people and to the people of surrounding areas. We saw the conversation with Nicodemus and how we learned a little bit more about who Jesus is and what is required for us and what he desires for us. And then for the last several weeks now, we've been working with this episode with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. And we keyed in on the phrase in this passage in John chapter 4 that Jesus said, if you knew who it was, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And we kind of keyed in on that phrase. And for the last couple of weeks, we've centered on this question, well, what hindered this woman at the well from asking Jesus? Jesus had something incredible to offer her, but what hindered her from coming to that and saying, I want what you have to offer? And remember, as we unfolded that out through a couple of weeks, we saw that, first of all, she was trying to deal with spiritual things through just that human mindset. She was limiting her thinking to the physical material, and she just didn't grasp the spiritual reality that he was talking about. And, and then we saw, too, that she was willing to, um, to receive that, but, but before that, I don't want to skip this one. She was trying to make herself acceptable by association. She knew that there was something not right with that relationship. Maybe it was simply the fact that she was a Samaritan and Jews don't talk to Samaritans. And so she tried to put herself in a better position by association. She did some spiritual name dropping with Jacob. It's his well. We worship at his well. So uh, there was that association. And then she was willing to receive from Jesus something that she thought might make her life better. She was willing to receive water if it meant never having to come and work again at the well. And that's kind of the maybe the birth of the prosperity gospel. But she wasn't necessarily willing to receive what he had to offer. And then really the thing that was the culmination of that, and Jesus brought it into focus at that point, she tried to avoid the issue of sin and the issue of morality by entering into religious discussion. And we realize with all of those things that we often do that. The world around us often does that. That we, we miss what Jesus has to offer us because we're hindered by one of those things. Well, this morning we want to turn to the other side of that conversation. And purposely we didn't dive into this phrase and this idea of living water. And what is it exactly that Jesus has to offer? What is he talking about when he says, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. What is this living water? So that's where we want to spend our time this morning on our way to the Lord's table. But let's read part of that account one more time. We're in the Gospel of John in chapter 4, and we're going to pick this up at verse 7. And it says this, And there came a woman of Samaria, Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. What's he talking about? What is he offering here? Well, first and foremost, we would tie this back to that opening phrase, that gift of God. If you knew the gift of God and you knew who it was who was talking with you, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And we equate that with the gift of God. And that's a right understanding, by the way. But what is the gift of God? Well, there are four things that we would look at. And the, the gift of God obviously includes four things, and the first is just forgiveness of sin. That is the gift of God. 
And, and we see that in different places in Scripture, but the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. It, it has to do with the forgiveness of sin, and we realize that we are all guilty. We are all sinners. We are sinners by nature, and we are all sinners by choice. And being sinners by nature and sinners by choice, we are under the condemnation of death. There's a penalty of death upon our lives because of our rebellion against God. But the gift of God is forgiveness. The gift of God is forgiveness from that sin. And when we speak of the forgiveness of sin as a gift of God, it isn't simply God deciding to dismiss our sin or to overlook our sin. We experience forgiveness because somebody else pays the penalty for our sin. That's the gospel. That's the truth. And that's what we, we cling to, and that's what we would come to Jesus for if we just knew. We only knew the gift of God, if we really knew the significance of that, we would ask and receive that forgiveness of sin. But it doesn't stop there. With the forgiveness of sin, there is a restoration of relationship. It's part of that gift of God. And we understand that we were created for a relationship with the Holy God at the very beginning. God, who existed in that perfect relational community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God said, let us make man in our image. In essence, God is saying, let's make man and let him enter into a relationship with us too. Because this is good. We're not on the same level, obviously, as the relationship of Father and Son and Father and Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit and Son. But God created us to enjoy relationship with him. And it was supposed to be good, but obviously sin messed that up. And that relationship was severed. And instead of being in relationship with God, we made ourselves enemy of, enemies of God. But when we embrace Jesus as Savior, this is the free gift of God. Not only do we experience the forgiveness of sin, but we are brought back into a relationship with God. Where once we were enemies, now we are brought back into sonship, into being the child of God. There's forgiveness, there's the relationship, and that's the gift of God. If we only just knew the gift of God and who it was that was offering, we would have asked, and Jesus would. It's forgiveness, it's restoration, it's also the release from bondage. We recognize that, that even though we are forgiven and our sins are dealt with and our name is written in the Lamb's book of life and he's written his name on our hearts, we still live in a world that is dominated by sin. And often we suffer the effects of that and sometimes that sin just grabs a hold of our life and it holds us captive life-dominating sins. But you know what Jesus came to offer? This is the gift of God. Release from that bondage. You don't have to be a, a slave to sin any longer. That's what God has offered to you. That's the gift of God. And if you only knew the gift of God, you would have asked. And you would have received it. And it's the forgiveness of sin and it's, it's the restoration of relationship and it's the release from bondage. But you know what else? It doesn't stop there. It's a hope that endures. Hope that endures. And that's where we are living now, this hope that endures, because God is, is ever at work around us and through us and in us, and God is always for us, and he's always working in our lives. And when the world presses in, when the world seems to be in chaos, we know that God is still with us, and we have a hope and a certainty that goes beyond the chaotic world when the pressures come and when the tragedies of life come and when the crisis just bombards us, we've got something beyond ourselves to hold on to and to cling to and to know that there is a hope that doesn't change. And when everything in our world is shattered, when everything disappears, there's one thing that remains, and that's that relationship with God. And that's the gift of God that he has to offer. And so again, Jesus said, if you only knew, you wouldn't hesitate. You would have asked, and you would have received that. That's the gift of God. But, you know, there's, there's something more to this. Because Jesus purposefully uses these words, living water. And, and while the living water and the gift of God, they are synonymous and they encompass all of those things, maybe there's some nuance to this that we also want to enjoy. And when we begin to look at that phrase, living water, and the other things that Jesus says about living water and never thirsting again, we realize some of the delightful details about this gift that he has to give us. 
and that he's offered us. Interesting, again, as we look at this text, we're in chapter 4, and, and this phrase that we see in verse 10. We could take this as a purposefully obscure statement. If you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. What is that? And, and that might be, maybe that was purposefully obscure because that's kind of Jesus' pattern. We saw that a couple weeks ago when we looked at Nicodemus and that statement, you must be born again, and Nicodemus's response to that is, I have no idea what you're talking about. But it drew him into deeper conversation. And that's really one of the teaching techniques that we see Jesus employing in the Gospels, that he'll throw out a statement that isn't quickly and readily understood, and, and the listeners either blow it off and go their way, or they say, well, give us more. We need to understand that. And often it's with the disciples themselves, with the apostles themselves, that later they come back and say, Jesus, you said something, and we don't get it. And so he gives them the explanation, and he draws them into a deeper conversation. So maybe... That's what's going on here. And certainly we saw how that played out with the woman at the well. Throughout this statement, she didn't understand it, but she was drawn in to a deeper conversation. She was ready to hear a deeper spiritual truth. But while we say that, we might also understand that this could be a familiar figure of speech. Because this isn't the first time, and it's not certainly not the only time in Scripture, where spiritual life is kind of equated to water and flowing water. We, we see it often in Scripture. The psalmist speaks of thirsting for God in a dry and weary land. But there's a recognition that I need something that quenches that emptiness in my life. Isaiah uh, chapter 44. I didn't give, these, give you room in your outline to write these down, but maybe you want to write these references. The first one was Psalm 42.1, speaking of just thirsting for God in that dry land. Isaiah 44, 3. We have just the indication from God and a promise from God that he was going to pour out water on a thirsty land. I'm going to pour out water on this land that's just longing and thirsty. Of course, he's speaking more of a spiritual truth than that physical longing and thirsty. A little later, Isaiah 55, chapter 1. The promise and the invitation, all who are thirsty, Come and drink freely. All who are thirsty, come and drink. Come and drink freely. Jeremiah uses a phrase in uh, chapter 2, right at verse 13. And just this indication that the people had forsaken God, a living fountain, a fountain of living water, and hewn for themselves cisterns that are broken that can't even hold water. And we've got that word play, and that's pretty close to what Jesus is describing here. That they forsook, they put aside the living water, and they tried to carve out for themselves a quenching, but it didn't hold water. Ezekiel speaks of a river of life. So, you know, there might be something in this. Maybe it was a familiar figure of speech. Maybe it was an obscure statement. But either way, as we dig in, we realize there's some depth here. There's something that we want to know. About this living water. So what should we know about living water? The first is that living water is dynamic. He's, Jesus is speaking about giving something that is dynamic. And part of that is our understanding. If we, maybe if we understood the culture a little more, the language of the culture, we would understand this word picture that maybe we miss. But in that culture, living water was often equated with moving water. Living water was water that was moving, that was flowing water, as opposed to cooled water. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that moving water was probably preferable to cooled water. Now, if you were in the desert and you came to the well, you would gladly drink from cooled water. But if you had your choice between cooled water and moving water, which would you choose? And, and that was part of the thinking, that, that living water, moving water, that's preferable water. And so on a really basic level, we might even paraphrase this to say, if you knew who it was, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who was asking you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the good stuff. This is the good stuff. This is flowing water. This is moving water. It's dynamic water. But when we look at that in that spiritual context, 
we realize that what God has to give us is not just stagnant. It's just not a one-time occurrence. This is dynamic. It keeps, we, we could say this is the water that keeps giving or the gift that keeps on giving. You know, we see it in, in Scripture. I, I think it's uh, Ecclesiastes that reminds us that the mercies of God are new every morning. And that's not just a promise that you're going to have a little bit of blessing every day. It's a promise that God is at work all of the time. God is at work around you all of the time. His mercies are new. They're all, there's always something to see. And God is at work through us all of the time, every morning. And God is at work in us and for us all of the time. When Jesus promises the living water, it's the water that is dynamic. It's a gift that is always going to be present and always going to be refreshing and always going to be needed. Not just a pool of water, but this is dynamic, living water. So it makes us think. If this is living water and it's refreshing and it's meant to be always refreshing, then the question and maybe the statement is that if your life seems stale, if your life in Christ seems stale at this moment, it's not the fault of the water that God has given to you. Maybe, maybe you're just drinking from the wrong cistern. Maybe you're trying to find that fullness of your life looking in the wrong direction. And maybe you're guilty of what the woman of the well was guilty of and, and just looking at uh, rightness by association. That you come and you hang around Christian people and you listen to Christian music, but you've never let the Word of God penetrate your heart. You're just hoping to be near it and hope that rubs off. But take a deep drink from what God has to offer you. It's satisfying and it's dynamic. Don't just be near it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. So, living water is dynamic water. And we see that in verse 10, but if we would drop down to verses 13 and 14, we also say that living water ever satisfies. It always, it ever satisfies. Look again at Jesus' statement as we jump to verse 13. Everyone who drinks of this well will thirst again. If you're looking to be right by association, that's not going to quench your thirst. If you're looking to be right by doing good deeds, that's not going to quench your thirst. If you're looking to fill the emptiness in your life by the things this world has to offer, it's not going to quench your thirst. doesn't matter what well you're drawing from, it's not going to quench your thirst. Anyone who drinks from this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him shall never thirst. Will never thirst. You know, the, the truth is this is the only thing that will keep on satisfying things that this world has to offer will distract us. It may momentarily delight us. And some of those things are delightful, but it won't continually satisfy us. And this is the only thing that will keep on satisfying us. And the best part about it is that it satisfies our greatest need. And our greatest need isn't for comfort, not for ease, it's not for prosperity, it's not for affluence. Our greatest need isn't even those basic needs of human existence. Our greatest need isn't food, shelter, and clothing, although those are pretty important things. Our greatest need is to have our sins forgiven and to be brought back to a right relationship with God. And this satisfies that greatest need. But the wonderful promise in the Word of God is when we look to that and we address that first, then the rest of it is take care of. And that's why we read those words of, of Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then, what's it say? All of these things will be added to you. Seek those first. If you seek to satisfy all of the peripheral things first, you're going to find your life continually empty and lacking, and you're going to be thirsting, and you're going to be longing, and it's never going to work. It's never going to satisfy. But seek first the kingdom of God. Seek that thing that keeps on satisfying. And all these other things... They're going to take care of themselves. It's not a promise that we get everything that we want, but it's a promise that our life is going to be in the right place. It's going to be satisfying regardless of the things that we have. It ever satisfies. But as we look at that, I want to point this out too. When Jesus says you'll never thirst again, I don't think we take that as an indication that it removes the craving. It doesn't remove a longing for God. 
see, we could get this wrong. We could get this wrong and say that, you know, once you have that religious experience with God, then you're good to go and you never really crave that ever again. You've done that once. Ever do, do that? Something you re always wanted to do and you do it and you say, well, that's good. I don't have to do that again. I, I don't know how many of you know, but for Donna's last birthday, is it was a significant number birthday, she wanted to do something significant on her birthday. And so she talked about this for quite a while. She jumped out of an airplane on her birthday because she always wanted to do that. And I followed her out the airplane on her birthday and got to the ground. It was a great experience. It was so much fun. I loved it. And, and Donna said, yeah, it was fun. And if you ask her, she'll say, I don't ever have to do that again. I did that once. It was great. It was fun. I'm glad I did it. I don't ever have to do it again. I, on the other hand, said I would go tomorrow. I'd do it again tomorrow. But, you know, this is not a case in our spiritual life where we say, you know, at that one time I had an experience with God. It was this religious experience. It was wonderful. It was great. I always wanted to experience something like that. And I did it once, and I never have to do it again. It's not what Jesus is saying when he said, never thirst again. In fact, the water that Jesus gives us doesn't remove the craving. It doesn't eliminate the craving. In fact, we might even make an argument that it makes the craving even greater. Because once we taste the goodness of God, we say, you know, that's what I want. I want more of that. And we taste more of the goodness of God. We say, that's what I want. I want more of that. And the more we know, the more we crave just to walk in relationship with God. We develop an appetite for that. We develop a taste for those spiritual things. And we want more and more. But the great part about that is the more we desire, the more God satisfies. He creates in us that hunger, that thirst, that longing, and he satisfies it. And then there's a greater hunger and thirst and longing, and he satisfies it. Because he loves us that much. We would never thirst again. There's one more thing that we would notice here. And we see it in verse 14. And, and the title that I give it on your notes there is that the living water is ever expanding. It's ever growing. It's ever expanding. Look at what he says in verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now, we read that and we say, there's something significant there. What is it? I, I don't quite get what he's saying there. It's a spring of water welling up within him. Maybe this is a case where not being speakers of Greek or speakers of Hebrew or Aramaic, as Jesus originally said it, that we kind of miss a word picture here. I think hidden in here is a word picture that isn't quite as obvious when we translate this to English. And, and it's the idea, just picture this, that we think now of a physical water, physical body of water, and it starts with a bubbling. It starts with a bubbling out of the ground. It's not just a pooling of water there, but you can see water bubbling out of the ground, and from the bubbling, there begins to flow a trickle, and from the trickle, a stream, and from the stream, a torrent, and eventually that torrent is just kind of swallowed up in a sea. I think that's kind of the word picture that Jesus has here. Read that and keep that in mind as we read that phrase in verse 14. But whoever drinks of this water that I give him shall never thirst again, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. I think that's pretty descriptive of what happens when we come to Christ. Descriptive of what happens in our life, in our experience, in our, our coming to Christ. Because it starts with just this little bit of bubbling. Maybe it's a recognition that something isn't right in your life. Maybe it's a recognition that spiritually you're not where you need to be. Or maybe it's a recognition that your life is, is marred with sin. And you need something else. And it's just a, a dissatisfaction that is bubbling in your life. Maybe it's that crisis that just drives you to your knees and for the first time you're willing to cry out and say, God, if you're real, let me know. It's just that realization. It's a bubbling that starts to bubble up. But you cry out to Jesus and you embrace Jesus and you discover that that bubbling has become a trickle. That there's something to that. And you see that God is at work in your life and it, it's good and it's refreshing. And the more you taste that, the more you desire that, you discover that trickle has become a stream beginning to pick up some momentum and there's power behind it. And that stream becomes a torrent and now it's powerful and it's taking you places you never expected to go. And your life's just kind of wrapped up in it and you realize I'm not in control anymore at, at all. 
my life is wrapped up in God and that stream, that torrent, eventually is just you know, swallowed up in eternity. So deep and it's so wide that it's swallowed up in eternity. And that's, for me, that's just a difficult one to grasp, to wrap my mind around. When does eternal life start? After you die? When you embrace Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, you possess eternal life right now. You have eternal life. And that's not just elongated life. That's full life. And, and that trickling, that bubbling, that trickling, that stream, that torrent, suddenly you just realize, man, I am full on into this thing that God has offered me. That's descriptive of our life in Christ. It's good stuff. It is the good stuff. And it's dynamic stuff. And it always satisfies, and it, it's ever-expanding. And by the way, when we say it's ever-expanding, don't get the wrong idea that you just get further and further into church stuff. When we say that this, this life that God has to you doesn't mean you just go deeper and you volunteer for a committee and then you're teaching Sunday school and then you're the Sunday school superintendent and then you're the pastor, or even worse than that, you become a deacon. You know, it, it's, it's not that. It's not that you get pulled in deeper and deeper and you have to do more and more, or it's not like some of those mystic false religions where you go deeper, you get further secrets about what's going on, you get the inside circle. It's not what it is at all. It just means that you discover more and more the wonder and the glory of what God has for you, ever expanding. But we go back to this, and I want to use this thought to lead us into our time at the Lord's table. We go back to this thought that we just need to know the source. Go back to verse 10, and that thought. Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. He would have given you living water. We have to know the source, and the source is Jesus. You can't get there any other way. Your life will never be satisfied except in Jesus. That's the source of it. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Nobody else can give it to you. And as much as I would love to do that for my children, I can't do that for my children. As much as I'd love to do that for my neighbors, I can't do that for my neighbors. He's the only one who can give that. We're going to talk about the requirements and the responsibility of that in just a moment. But he is the only one who can give it. But here's the good news. It's a gift that God delights to give. You would have asked, and he would have given you this. If you only knew the gift of God, the gift of God, this is what God delights and desires to give you. And, and you know, just the very important nuance of that, this is not something we have to beg for. This is not something that we have to convince God to give us. God is not a stingy God. He doesn't begrudgingly dole out salvation and forgiveness. God is longing, and from the very beginning, has longed to bring us back to relationship with himself. Not for his good, but for our good. And he longs to give us that gift. He only knew the gift of God who it is that was offering that gift, you would have asked him, and he would have given it to you. And that brings us to the requirement. What is the requirement? You have to believe it. You have to take God at his word and realize that there is an offer of salvation for you. And that offer of salvation is only in his sight. It's only in Jesus. You can't work it. You can't earn it. You can't pretend that you don't need it. It's only in his son. You have to believe God and take him at his word. And then what do you do? You just ask. You ask. You know, Marcus and I were talking about this briefly this morning, this idea that y you do have to ask, and yet it's, it's not work on our part. It's just simply saying, God, give me what you have offered to me. We don't have to convince God, but we do have to ask him because God is not going to force us to love him. God is not going to force us to be forgiven or to be restored. But he's always willing to do that, and all we have to do is to ask. And if we only knew the gift of God, and if we only understood who it was that was offering that, we would ask immediately. There would be no hesitation. And then what do you do? With any gift, you receive it. You receive it. In essence, you just start living it. Live like you believe it. Live because you begin to enjoy what God has for you. That's the living water that God has for you. We only knew 
wouldn't hesitate to do that. Amen? Let's take that thought into our time at the Lord's table this morning. I'm going to have our, have our deacons come to the front.